a Mexico com tech startup changing and, and influencing the world for good. It's also a story of perseverance, of tenacity, <laughs> of the ups and downs of the startup world. So it's a great, uh, the mic is not, where is mic's not working? Um, is it working? Yeah, okay. So uh, let's take a seat and we're just gonna have a chat and kind of share with you as a story of inspiration all about um, Bridgeify. So, Jorge, just I'll, I'll let you talk about Bridgeify, and then we're going to play a brief video clip, which is kind of like where we are today, and then we'll take it back in time and tell the story of Bridgeify. Sure. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so, Bridgeify was born on a bus uh, around five years ago. We were selected. My co my previous co-founders and I were selected to represent Mexico in this international hackathon called Startup Bus, and so. Rich Ride, the as a concept, the idea was born on a bus, and it was born as a, uh, we wanted to build a messaging app that we could use like WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger, but that also worked without internet, because we found that even being in Mexico City after the earthquakes or any natural disaster or any large event, you found yourself without being able to use your smartphone. So we identified that opportunity as being huge and being very important to a lot of people, and that when we lose access to data, we it basically renders our smartphone useless, almost useless. Um, so we decided to start uh, developing that that app. So we we went on and got second place out of like forty something teams, um, and we decided to turn it into a company. And then in time, after a lot of ups and downs, more more downs and ups, um, we decided to move from the messaging app into a B two B model where we actually license that technology to other apps. Uh, such as, let's say, Uber or Twitter or Facebook Messenger, etc., so that we could use those apps without access to data, opening up engagement and revenue for these companies and improving the user experience for, for all of us. And, and Jorge, when I, what your, your initial concept behind it was uh, the cost of cell phone access, correct? And also national uh, or natural disasters or emergencies where you couldn't use your cell phone. Is it, can, you, can you elaborate on what your thinking was behind the, the app as you originally envisioned it, or the technology as you originally envisioned it? Right, so when we originally thought of it, we, we thought it was going to be a product that we, ourselves, we could, um, we could use when we went to music festivals, when we found ourselves <laughs> in the middle of nowhere, like, like right here, where you do have access to a data plan, and <laughs> that's a good thing. Uh, you do have access to a data plan. You can you can afford it, but you don't always uh, have the connectivity that you need. And then in the other in the other part of the market is the uh, millions and millions of people that do have a smartphone, but don't necessarily have access to a constant data plan. And so we identified that as being uh, a really really urgent need to fill. And that technologies like 4G, 4G took years and years to roll out, and it still hasn't rolled out completely. And uh, now we're all, we're already talking about 5G, which is going to take another a, a very long time to roll out and, and cover a significant amount of people. So we know that um, people in Indonesia, people in Hong Kong, uh, in Turkey, etc., they need a solution and they need it now. And we, we knew that by leveraging this technology and being able to approach companies that already have millions of uses, we could get our technology onto, onto that many hands very, very quickly. And today, I mean today, uh, you, well, let's, let's play the video clip and um, I think this is, this is one of Jorge's advisors. And this was, uh, I was at this demo day in San Francisco. This is actually where the AP failure half occurred. <laughs> to introduce this next company, we have Twitter co-founder Biz Stone. Hello. Yes. An introduction for an introduction for an introduction. Yes, I'm co-founder of Twitter, and I am an honorary member of the Bridgeify team by way of being an angel investor and a hands-on advisor. When I first got involved with Bridgeify, I was just astonished at the massive potential of such a simple idea. It really made me feel in my gut like I felt in the early days of Twitter. And I just knew that down the line something big was going to happen with these guys. And in fact, if you are following the news, uh, Bridgeify is actually saving lives halfway around the world. And they have so much more ahead of them. I mean, uh, we're, we're t in talks right now about, about using their SDK, and that, you'll see, is a no-brainer. 
And so uh, let me bring up my good friend Jorge, who's not nervous at all, to tell you about more about how Bridgeify works and why it's so awesome. Come on, Jorge. Hey, we can stop. Everybody loves you. So Biz was invited to come and, and do this talk with Jorge today, and he's got uh, quite a bit going on at Twitter at the moment, but we're hoping to get him here next year to have a follow-up conversation once uh, Bridgeify integrates with Twitter. But, uh, yeah, we're, we're, it's an exciting and powerful uh, ally and advisor to have because, Jorge, maybe you can talk about it, but in the early days, I remember I remember going to fellow VCs and investors. No one really got the concept, correct? Um, unfortunately, no, because um, a misconception that we have right now is that everybody has access to internet, and when we, when we approach Silicon Valley uh, funds, that was the reaction that we got. But I always have access to data. Or, but I only have to turn on my Wi-Fi and then I have access to data, right? Like not even, and these were like really, really important technology funds that we got to talk to and they didn't actually get the concept or the need. So the, the, the first investors that we got, the first significant investors that we got in the company's history were uh, funds that were outside of Silicon Valley or even outside of the United States where the, the need was more uh, obvious and where the, the problem was a little bit more relatable. Uh, we got investors from Indonesia, we got, they have a, a huge amount of earthquakes. We got uh, investors from Mexico, we got investors from uh, all over the place, uh, except California at the very beginning, because that's where we had to go. We, we tried with, I think it was 120 funds in our first year of fundraising in, the, in, in California, and we only got one. Uh, one fund to invest in us, so we had to actually start looking elsewhere because, the, like I said, the, the problem wasn't as, it didn't affect them, so they thought that it wasn't a real problem. And I think, I, I think we see our team from Lagos can probably see some similarities in the problems that you're facing in Africa or the challenges that you can innovate to overcome, but in Silicon Valley sometimes they're not seeing those challenges so they don't understand it. Um, Talk about what happened this year, because I remember January a year ago, we had breakfast and you told me <laughs> that your two co-founders had uh, needed to depart and you were about to enter the Alchemist Accelerator and things were kind of kind of bleak, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, like I said at the beginning, there, were, there have been more downs and ups in the company's history because um, through since 2014 that we founded the company, we I think it was two or three times a year that we had consider, uh, we actually considered closing down the company because we were running out of money. And then something happened or we did something, we won a contest and won a check or we convinced uh, one of our previous investors of coming in with another small check that gave us oxygen um, or found a new fund that we hadn't considered and uh, it, it saved us. So we actually went from almost telling our team that we were closing the doors to actually being able to have the opportunity to keep working. So. In one of those downs, uh, in late 2018, uh, we, we ran out of money again. Uh, a couple of our engineers uh, left because uh, they had families and they, they actually couldn't go go any longer with the ups and downs. So we started losing engineers, so a couple of my, my two co-founders left the company. Um, uh, fortunately, I convinced them of leaving their shares behind. Uh, and then uh, literally, I think it was, uh, I think I met with you, two or three days after it had happened, we got investment from this fund that we had been courting for a while. And in the same week, we got accepted to the Alchemist Accelerator, which is the top B2B uh, accelerator in the world. So it was great timing for me, because they left and they left the equity behind, which allowed us to partner up with new funds and allowed us to uh, join the accelerator. So in that year, after they left, we we launched our new product, the, the B2B side of Bridgefight. We got to, what was it, 21,000 developer signups on our website, 1.5 million downloads for our sample app that you're welcome to download right now. Uh, and we got investment again from BizDone, we got investment from Funds in New York, we got to, uh, we, we passed our, our fundraising milestone by a lot, almost by double. Um, so it was great timing for, <laughs> things happened for a reason. And we, we haven't specifically mentioned what Biz refers to when he was doing the introduction, uh, the Hong Kong protests and, and that whole, uh, explosion of awareness of what Bridgeify, the power of Bridgeify, and what it can do, the test case, if you will. So can you talk a little bit about that and how you reacted when you first started seeing those numbers hit? Yeah, uh, we actually found out because we... And, we, and Bridgeify is powering all the communication of the Hong Kong protests, or had, had been at the very beginning and then later spread to India, so... Right, so 
uh, we started the, the acceleration program in April, and we didn't know we had the option of graduating or doing our demo day in front of, I think it was uh, almost 2,000 funds. So if you graduated and you pitched in front of, of these funds, we had the option of doing it in late September or moving it all the way to January, January 2020. So we didn't really have the traction that we wanted. We didn't really have the momentum. So we said, okay, let's just uh, keep the money that we have and uh, keep going until January. But then in, uh, it was June, July that things started exploding in Hong Kong. Uh, the protesters started uh, going out on the streets and the internet shut down and stuff like that. So we found out because of uh, a news article that uh, the Contexto made for us that we were actually trending. Because we don't, we don't actually. We did used to follow the app numbers, but we follow the B two B product numbers more because it's the one that uh, that we license that we monetize. So we find out that the app is trending, and we're like, oh, okay. we were like, okay, another twenty, thirty thousand downloads. Like sometimes we get in Mexico City when there's a music festival or whenever there's a natural disaster. But it turned out that we had gotten one hundred forty-five thousand downloads in just two or three days in Hong Kong. So a lot of the, the blockchain community, for example, that they obviously value privacy and all of that, that we start uh, talking about BridgeFi and then uh, NGOs start talking about BridgeFi, we get on Forbes and the BBC News. So it started becoming, it got to the point where we started becoming like a threat to China. Um, so we, we got our website hacked a couple times and uh, they, they banned our app for a few days, but then it came back up. So that's when we realized, okay, this is the, the traction that we need because the app downloads made people realize that Bridgefy existed, so they came to our website, and then developers found out that we had a, a product for them to integrate into their own apps. So that got us the almost 20, 21,000 developer signups on our website, so we were like, okay, we have the traction on the B2C side, on the B2B side. Um, it's, it's obvious that it's working out in the wild, because we in one day we had 96,000 people using the app in the same, in the same place, and everything worked beautifully. Um, so that's when we started fundraising, because we got that momentum. and then. Since then, we had another 72,000 downloads in Turkey, and then I think it was in India, 450,000 downloads in one week. Um, uh, so yeah, things got crazy in, in a very small period of time, so it really turned the company around. And, um, and so what, uh, now, what's your next step? I mean, so your, your real business model is having this integrated into other company apps, or other apps, or other products, right? Right. So yeah, all those numbers that I just spoke about are the app, the, the demo app that we use for uh, for to show the case of technology. But the, the, our business model is based on the Bridge by SDK, which is basically software that you integrate into your own app. It's an events app, a gaming app, natural disasters, education, etc. And it makes it work without internet. It uses Bluetooth instead of data. So what we're doing now this year, well, the next two years, is that we're focusing on growth. It's basically right now we're building a, a growth team. Uh, based on product and based on, on digital marketing. And we're trying to get to the milestones that we need to be able to sit with, uh, working with small and medium-sized companies so that we can sit down, hopefully in two years, with Uber or Tinder or Twitter or Facebook and be able to say, um, we, we can increase engagement and sales for your app by this much percent and already have that number. Be able to sit down with Uber and say, we can increase uh, rides by 20%. That's huge for them. So that's our goal for the next two years. So everybody working on apps here today should make sure you talk to Jorge and integrate it so that you never lose the potential usage uh, inside of your company. Um, one, one thing I really want to touch on, it, and this is, I think, the friendship we've developed over the years of working together, is your incredible focus, tenacity, belief in it. Um, I've been so impressed with you as a CEO and as a uh, just as an individual to really power through all of this, how, how did you keep it going and, you know, would, <laughs> is there anything you would have done differently? A lot of things, I guess, um, but uh, I think it's just stubbornness and just <laughs> not wanting to, uh, whenever there's a, a low point in the company, just trying to figure out what to do to get it up and just not basically just give up. I know it sounds corny and it sounds cliche, but I mean, sometimes you have to keep digging and keep digging, and then you you you, you find gold. You know, like that. Uh, it's, sometimes you just need to keep going, even though it, it, it's hard to imagine a way out. Uh, fortunately, every time that we have had the the need to keep going when things were really really dark, we we've been able to come up uh, and, and get air again. But um, hopefully, hopefully things will will not get as bleak from now on. Yeah, and I, I mean, I remember when we first connected, it was before Twitter Hatch, I immediately got the technology and how it could be beneficial, but it was very difficult to communicate to other people what that value would be, um, 
And I even had other people in Silicon Valley saying, I don't think that can exist. And these are very smart people, you know, and say, and if it can, I don't think it'd be developed in Mexico. We, yeah, we actually had that happen several times, where we actually sat down with, uh, with accelerators or with uh, funds right in the in the early days of Bridge Fight, and they said, no, this technology has been proven that it can ex it cannot exist. It cannot exist on mobile because mo mesh networks, the connecting uh, devices so on chains that we call mesh networks, has existed for a very long time, but not for mobile devices because it, everything moves, everything has a different operating system or a different uh, version of Bluetooth, for example. So a lot of people told us that uh, it couldn't exist. So that's when we started doubting ourselves, but we already built it. So we just kept going. <laughs> yeah, and they and they wouldn't believe us. We actually. Uh, we actually, I remember this, this meeting really, really cl clearly with a fund that they said, no, this technology can't can exist. Like, it's already been attempted and uh, people have, people with more money and uh, with better, with PhDs that you don't have, have attempted this and, and they haven't been able to build it. And we said, can we go outside and we can show this to you? And this person actually said, no, but it doesn't exist. It, it can't exist. And I, we, we're, we're constantly testing it out in Mexico City, like a uh, kilometer and a half, like covering it completely offline. And we actually had people say, no, 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 it's, it's impossible. It's, 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 uh, it's too good to be true. And we're like, we have the patents already in place. Like that kind of, of pushback was, uh, the, was what we had to put up with in the very beginning. Fortunately, now we have the numbers to sit down with a fund and say 1.5 people can't be wrong. And we actually now own the patents and we have like these amazing partnerships. So um, yeah, things at the beginning were a little bit, it, it was mind blowing, you know, like. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I suffered that through you and I didn't have the, the total background to, to be able to defend it as much as you. Um, in wrapping up, what else what would you, any advice, any anything you'd like to share? Advice to uh, to our audience to uh, download Ridgeway. That's <laughs> 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 number one. Um, and number two, I would say that um, even if you're building something that, for example, I, I've spoken to a few people since, since we got here on, on Sunday, and even if you're building something that already exists in the United States or, or is already, if you even if you have a lot of competition, like a big competitor or an incumbent or whatever, I, it doesn't mean that it can't be successful in Mexico, and it doesn't mean that if it's, if something is already successful in the United States, uh, the world is a very very large place, and uh, the markets for almost anything are huge. So uh, just that, like. It, I met somebody yesterday, they're building something that already exists in the States and they're thinking, oh, maybe the competitors are, are too big, maybe nobody will invest in this because it already exists. But the, the world is huge and if somebody in California won't invest in you, it doesn't mean that you won't find the, the right partner elsewhere. And uh, that even if a, a type of technology doesn't make sense in California or in the United States as a whole and you get rejected, it doesn't mean that the rest of the world won't appreciate it. So that would be something that I would recommend. Yeah. Well, um, and we do have one of Richify's investors in our audience today, too. So, um, uh, anyway, let's give it up for Jorge. So excited to see the success, the well deserved hard work. Thank you. And, uh, and pay attention to Richify because I have a feeling this is only the beginning. Thank you very much. <laughs>